If you believe everything you read and watch it on YouTube, every engine out there with an EGR system, which is pretty much every engine now, will die because of the EGR system. It will cause massive amounts of carbon buildup. Now, the reality is that's not always the case. I see plenty of cars that do one, two, three hundred thousand miles on the original EGR with a minimal amount of carbon buildup. So it's probably wrong to blame EGR. But why have we got EGR when there's so much hatred for EGR? What does the EGR system actually do? for us, for our cars, for the environment. My aim in this video is to bust some of the blatant misrepresentation of facts to make people feel good about removing the EGR. And it just enables you to make an informed decision. Once you've got all of the facts in place and you fully understand all of the mechanisms, you can then make an informed decision as to whether you need to remove the EGR from your car or you don't need to remove the EGR from your car. And most of this debate is going to be environmental. But one question we need to look at is how much of the environmental impact, the emissions that we're dealing with in the environment is down to the motorist? Is the motorist being unfairly blamed for large proportions of emissions? So let's talk about the elephant in the room, EGR and NOx gases. If we just want to bury our heads in the sand, assuming that we know everything already, don't watch this video. But if you're interested in learning and you want to understand the nuances of the arguments for and against EGR removal, then watch this video and come to your own conclusion at the end. A lot of people might be looking at things that happen in nature like lightning and using that as an example for a benefit of NOx gases because when there's a storm, an electrical lightning storm, it produces NOx gases and this is good for the fields. It has beneficial effects overall. So why is it so bad to have this coming out of the exhaust pipe of a car or are they just making a big fuss unnecessarily? Well, firstly, the estimated output from lightning storms is about 40 to 50 teragrams per year. And comparing that with the output of motor vehicles, we have between 100 and 150 teragrams per year. In the grand scheme of things, car exhausts are putting out a lot more than lightning. Now, let's think about where it's happening. People often wrongly assume that if something is in the atmosphere, it's just mixed up and it's a very, very thorough mix. But in reality, there are layers in the atmosphere. We know about the ozone layer and we know the problems that we get when ozone is down at ground level. And it's a similar effect for NOx gases as well. When you have a thunderstorm, first of all, this happens high up. The NOx gases react with other gases in the atmosphere. And also we have the rain pulling this down to the ground and feeding it into the soil. And with tailpipes, you just have this gas hanging around at ground level where it's not interacting in the same way. And it is a serious problem to human health. NOx gases are extremely poisonous. They cause a lot of damage to people's lungs. And you can understand why manufacturers are under so much pressure to reduce these gases. The EGR system reduces it by reducing the temperature. As you burn fuel, the hotter that is, the more NOx gases are produced. And the EGR system only cuts in when an engine is near idling or under very, very light load. A very very, very limited conditions. If you want performance from your engine, the EGR system is generally closed. And during the warm up cycle, the EGR system is closed. It's really designed to reduce the emissions without compromising the overall performance of the car. The way it works effectively is reducing the cylinder capacity. A cylinder itself will suck in so much air in each combustion cycle. If it can't suck in as much air and it's got some exhaust gases going in, you've reduced the capacity of the cylinder. There's going to be less oxygen to burn is going to use less fuel, although a little bit of extra fuel is injected just to get the mix right for this weird input of exhaust gases and oxygen that it would normally have from the air. Our atmosphere is made up of a variety of gases. Nitrogen makes up about 78%. Oxygen or O2 is 21%, argon is 0.9%, and CO2 is a 0.04%. Now, why do they make such a big thing of CO2, although it's such a small gas in our atmosphere? It's fair to say that if we were cooking, a small amount of salt makes a big difference to the overall flavour, but add too much salt, and that's going to be detrimental to the whole dish. And the atmosphere is a very delicate balance, a cocktail of these gases. In the right quantities and at the right altitudes, these gases protect us 
from the sun's rays. They limit the amount of warming that can go on. And CO2 gas is known to trap heat or trap energy in the atmosphere, and that can contribute to warming. I won't go into the exact sciences. There's a lot of debate between experts as to the mechanisms involved in global warming, climate change. And a lot of people just think it's a complete myth because they see these arguments going on and they would rather bury their heads in the sand. We have to acknowledge the fact that the weather patterns are changing. We're finding extremes in weather. We're having unusually hot Mays. We're having extreme high winds at other times of the year. There's major flooding going on in one country after another. There is something happening there. Now, is it fair to blame all of this on the motorist? Well, the motorist is only a contributing factor overall, but the motorist is probably one of the easiest things to target. 30 to 35% of CO2 emissions, we're talking CO2, but it's fair to say it will include other emissions in the same ratio. That's over a third created by industry. And we need industry. It produces our food. It produces our possessions. It produces the things that we need to do our jobs. It produces the things that we need to build the cars in the first place. If we drill down, we see that steel and cement, two staples in our industry at the moment, account for about 20 to 25 percent of CO2 emissions. Vehicles and transportation contribute to about 20 to 25 percent. So we are unfortunately quite a big contributing factor to those emissions. But that figure includes cars, buses and all forms of transportation. Let's just drill down and just look at the motorist, the road users, the cars, the trucks and the vans. They're estimated to produce between 15 and 18 percent of the world's CO2 emissions. You might point up at the sky and look at all the aircraft that are flying around, but the reality is they only contribute about 3 percent of the global CO2 output. You can see why manufacturers have been pressured to reducing emissions from cars. I'll leave you to debate in the comments as to whether this is going to help the environment or whether we're just being unfairly targeted. But there is a bigger problem here than just the motorist. To minimize our CO2 output, we almost have to go back to the dark ages, not use electricity, eat raw food. And I think that really would be a step too far for most people. We can all do our bit by driving economically, by limiting the amount of journeys that we do, avoiding those short journeys, which are big polluters and also can be quite damaging to our cars if we're not careful, if we don't have those long drives to get rid of everything that's been dumped in the oil and give the engine a good old chance to clear out everything that's built up. But the problem of global warming is a complex one. It's become very political. Political parties often make or break their reputation based on their stand and people get behind them. But as a motorist, we just have to accept that we are contributing some way to overall pollution and we have a moral duty or a moral obligation to think about the emissions that we're getting from our vehicle. And the easy answers seem to be pushing us all into EVs and electric cars. But then you have to look at the manufacturing costs, the fact that the electricity is still generated and whether that electricity is cleanly generated. It's fair to say, though, taking a reasonable view that EVs are less polluting than our combustion engine cars. But when you have to replace your car more regularly, that brings into question any CO2 savings and all the other industrial input that goes into this. So thanks for watching. Please boot the like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. That does help us to get out there when the algorithm sees subscribers. And I've lined this video and this playlist up for you that you should find really interesting. Thanks for watching. See you in this next video.